Hi kids, Mr. Galvan again. We're gonna go ahead and continue with Bandit's Moon chapter 12. Ready? The events at Sawmill Flat. Here we go. We wound our way through the shadowy pines and live oaks. I couldn't help noticing that a sharper alertness had settled in Joaquin's eyes. He had the look of a man expecting to step on a rattlesnake at any moment. I don't think it was concern about the new posse. The very air in these hills seemed to threaten him. Long after the sun went down, we crept silently into the woods above Sawmill Flat and made camp. Joaquin wouldn't light a fire, not even to light one of his twisty cigars. During the days, he gazed down on the miners, on miners in the stream below. They worked away at their gold pans in long boxes, washing out the earth for treasure. We could hear the distant voices, but not exactly what they were saying. An adobe house with what appeared to be a grapevine clutching its way up the south wall on the slope of the hill. Joaquin sent me into Sonora a few miles away to see if the news of his death had arrived. Sonora seemed almost a big city after the shanty towns we had been in, but I could pick up no information about Lank and nobody was jabbering about the happy end of Joaquin Murrieta. Because of holdups on the road, I learned it had been weeks since the newspaper from Stockton had reached Sonora. During the next two days, Joaquin said, only a few words to me and those in a whisper. He was silent as an owl about to take wing and strike. I grew edgy. Did he mean to murder those innocent men below? Why? Because they were gringos? I made up my mind to warn them, but how? A sneeze would carry into the stillness. Wouldn't that let them know there was someone lurking in the woods above them? Joaquin would have a fit. But when I awoke in the morning, his deed was done. Joaquin had struck in the night and returned with seven rawhide pouches of gold, each the size of a hip pocket. <gasps> you robbed them, I said. Of course, muchacha. You didn't notice the big hombre in the blue shirt loading up his saddlebags. My spy told me those miners planned to deposit their gold dust in the Wells Fargo vault. I took every ounce without firing a shot. But those men worked hard for that gold. True. But you see that grapevine? My wife, Carmela, planted it. See the house? I built it. That was my land, muchacha. But the Yankee miners jumped in my claim. I stole nothing. Can I appear in a court to reclaim my land, eh? An outlaw? The gold in these pouches was mine from the beginning. If the gringos wished to oblige me by digging it out, I let them. I peered down the hillside again. I saw a tall pine straight as a lance and wondered if that was the tree that the ruffian Calico and his friend had used to hang Joaquin's brother. And it must have been from the earth and adobe below that Calico's men had carried off Carmela. I now knew why Joaquin's mood had darkened as we approached the, these hills. For him, the ground must still be steaming with brimstone and fire. We faded away into the mountains and a few days later, Joaquin surprised me by riding boldly into Murphy's diggings. I had a feeling that he couldn't stand lurking in the shadows any longer. He needed to step out into the footlights and thumb his nose at the Yankees. No one after all would take him for a famous outlaw all dusted off in a top hat and with an innocent girl in a white bonnet riding beside him. It must have appealed to his thirst for danger. So there we were on the busy street tying up our horses outside a butcher shop when a voice rang out. I saw a finger as long as a stick pointing our way. That's him, that's him, see, see, that's Joaquin, the bandit. On his rattle-boned rattle horse sat the Chilean imposter. Catch him, he shouted. The fancy sobrero doesn't fool me. Me, I've looked into the eyes of Joaquin himself. Aye, that's him. That's Joaquin the bandit. The reward is mine. Like an alarm bell, the shouting brought men running toward us with new shouts of their own. Joaquin, the bandit, there's a thousand dollars on his head, dead or alive. 
Joaquin tried to leap back onto his saddle, but a miner in a checkered shirt caught his leg and held on like a bear. I hardly had time to catch my breath before the men had Joaquin wrestle to the ground. The imposter was grinning wildly. Remember, hombres, I saw him first. See, the reward is mine. I can't explain my sudden blind fury. How dare this bumbling clod denounce Joaquin, who had spared his life? I was astonished to hear my own voice rising above the others. You are mistaken, sir. Your only reward will be if this gentleman spares your life again. The miners had disarmed Joaquin of his pistol, pistols and knife and dragged him back to his feet. I was surprised at how small he looked among them. An oaf in the crowd, who seemed to be all heavy shoulders and narrow eyes, declared, Yep, he's a greaser. Look like Joaquin must be him. If you mean he's Mexican, it's true, I shouted. But he's entitled to be tried by the court of law, not hanged by a mob in the street. Joaquin threw me a baffled glance. What was I yelling about? Didn't I know that he'd been in tighter spots than this? He could take care of himself. But I couldn't stop shouting. He's an educated man. Joaquin the Bandit cannot even sign his own name. Look at this. I made a dive for the pillowcase tied to my saddle horn and pulled out the book. Here's my mother's cookbook. I said and held it up for all to see. Could Joaquin the bandit read it? <laughs> of course not. Senor, read a page for the edification of these men. A blacksmith in his leather apron took the book from me and held it in front of Joaquin's face, upside down. I took it out of his hands, righted the book and held it up myself. Senor, what does this page say? Oh, but of course, daughter said Joaquin with all the grace and airs of a stage actor. He seemed pleased with my quick thinking. He read it in a loud voice, as if hatched by Shakespeare himself. Edding pie. What in tarnation tearing pie, someone else asked. Said Joaquin, oh, you call yourself civilized, sir, and you've never dined on edding pie? I've eaten my weight in it, said a man with a New England accent. accent. Read on, commanded the blacksmith. Take white pickled eddings, Joaquin declared, for he knew the words by heart. Boil them a little, remove the skin, keep the backs only and remove the bones, put them in a pastry casing. Oh, that'll do, said a white haired man who turned out to be the local printer. He screwed up his eyes to glance at the printed page. That's what the book says, word for word. Boys, you owe this gent an apology. apology. Give him back his guns. A smile broke across Joaquin's face. As the stino, he said to me in a soft whisper. There was nothing to fear, daughter. It would be my destiny to hang from a limb of an oak tree. You see the hanging end. You see the hanging tree at the end of the street. It is not oak. And another thing the white-haired printer was saying, the newspapers just in from Stockton. Joaquin the bandit will disturb the peace no more. The rascal is dead. And that's the end of that chapter.